Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry if I seem a little rushed, but we're in crunch, and I, uh, I have no excuse. I flat out overslept. So, <laughs> um, as uh, Professor Leiden said, my name is uh, Jason Shankle. I'm a senior software engineer at Electronic Arts uh, Maxis, and I'm uh, here today to talk about the uh, elements of computer game design. Elements of computer game design. Um, as applied um, most specifically to Spore uh, in the game that I've been developing uh, with the team that I'm working on right now. Yeah. It's a uh, PC title um, which takes place in uh, a galaxy and you start off as a, as a little squiggly protozoa and you <coughs> work your way up to uh, the, let's see if the powerpoint you You eventually work your way up to uh, being a, a galaxy spanning civilization and the uh, difficulty that we've run into with Spore is that unlike a lot of other games, even that we've developed fairly complicated games, this game has a very broad uh, spectrum of uh, different game genres that are represented. Uh, you play sometimes it plays like a role-playing game, sometimes it plays like a real-time strategy game, sometimes it plays like an adventure game, sometimes it plays like a, a strategic simulation game, and as a result, um, we've had to kind of develop a more elaborate vocabulary. All right, fine. How about the web page? Will that work? We had to develop a fairly elaborate vocabulary uh, and a fairly abstract vocabulary um, for describing the elements inside of, of, of our design. And this vocabulary is um, it's not by any means <coughs> universal. Um, so in this this vocabulary that we've developed to describe the elements of our of, of our game design matches fairly closely with other teams. Other teams certainly within Electronic Arts and other teams are working on games. We're coming to a point where the discipline of game design, which used to be uh, a subset pretty much of game programming, you know, lead programmers would be game designers, uh, that the discipline of game design has become its own thing, and becoming its own thing means developing its own native vocabulary. And in the past, pretty much game, the, the vocabulary of game design matched the vocabulary of the, of the programming languages and, and the hardware that you were working in. Uh, the designer would think in terms of the machine that we're building for. Now, of course, machines are much more abstract and you need to be able to port things everywhere and designers are not programmers, typically, or didn't, they're not even people who used to be programmers. They're their, their own entity. And so we've had to develop a vocabulary between designers and game developers, game programmers, engineers, artists, uh, that we can all sort of share. This is one such vocabulary. It's the one we've been developing on Spore. There are others. It's not by any means an industry <coughs> standard, but it, this is the kind of set of ideas that we're beginning to absorb. So the elements, the key elements of this is a planet shot from Spore, as our little Spore world. And sort of the key elements of the, inter of the design that we've identified are nouns, verbs, the interface, the rules, and the fiction. These are five things that you basically can't design a game without defining in one way or another. Uh, you can probably carve up your definitions in a different way. You could, you, there might be other uh, etymologies that you could use. But essentially, if you take any game, you can analyze it according to these uh, criteria. So I'm going to start uh, quickly with nouns and verbs. Nouns and verbs are um, abstract and concrete actions and events that take place within your game world. Okay, that either exist within or take place within your game world, or within the game, not within the game world. I take that back, within your game. Um, and here you can see a couple of shots from Super Paper Mario for the Wii. Um, Mario is one of your very basic and simple sort of noun verb environments. Uh, anybody who hasn't played Mario, it's typically a side, uh, a 2D side scroller. Most Mario games are that way. Um, and uh, Mario's verbs are Mario can jump, Mario can land on an enemy. Uh, and neutralize them, put them in neutral form. Mario can pick up a neutral enemy or, or, or a neutral object, and Mario can throw that object. The other nouns are your enemies, the little mushroom guys and, your, and the turtles, and the bricks, which you can break or bump with your head. 
right? And so basically jump on things, jump on bricks, jump on enemies, grab enemies. You can't grab bricks, right? And in Super Paper Mario, they added a feature where you can, uh, you're playing the game mostly in 2D, but you can scroll over in what is a more abstract verb uh, into the 3D world. Uh, and for a limited period of time, your character can become, uh, can, can manipulate the depth of the game. So if you come up to an obstacle in Super Paper Mario, that's an obstacle in 2D, a wall that prevents you from proceeding, you can flip into the, two, into the 3D world and you'll typically see that the wall is something you can walk behind. Now that flipping into 3D mode is also a verb. And it's a somewhat abstract verb. It is tied to something that Mario is actually doing in the game, which is he, he puts his arm up and says, I'm going into the 3D world. <coughs> but in reality, it's just basically a player-driven verb to change the play field. It's not clear exactly how Mario turning to the left changes the rules of his physical movement in the fiction of the game, but it's a verb that the player executes in order to completely alter the play field of the game. So we can see that verbs and nouns don't necessarily have to literally be the apples and oranges of your real world in the game, they can be things that simply the player does. Other verbs that are totally abstract can be things uh, like load save, you know, or changing your brightness, or modifying your screen size, or changing your window size, things like that. These are verbs as well. And the relationship between a noun and a verb and whether it's supposed to be part of the game or something that's extra to the game is something I'll go into more when we talk about fiction. Okay. So when you're starting off to design a game, the first kind of and this is not necessarily to imply an order, but one of the early things you have to do is kind of come up with a list of nouns and verbs. What are my pieces, and what is the total open space of how they could possibly move? Okay. The next thing you want to think about is interface. Right? Now, uh, interface design is it's a whole discipline unto itself. I'm sure you can have an entire colloquium based on your human machine interface, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details as to what makes a good interface or a bad interface, but the one thing you have to do when you're developing a piece of entertainment software is determine what is the role of the interface in providing entertainment to the player in the game. And there, as with many things, you can, you can measure this along a sort of polar, by a set of polar extremes. On one extreme, you have games like poker, chess, backgammon. These are highly abstract, board, card games. They've exi they exist in the real world in a very abstract form um, where the interface doesn't really matter too much because all that matters to you in poker and chess and backgammon is decision making. That is the game. You make a decision. You execute a move. Your opponent makes a decision to counter your goal. You make a counter decision, counter decision, counter decision. It is entirely, the, the, you know, we've all heard about chess masters who play chess in their heads with other chess masters. There's no interface except for simply speaking, you know, two letters and two numbers to, to, a, to somebody else who then tells you two letters and two numbers back. The game exists entirely in their heads. It's just a string. There's a string of legal responses to anybody's K7 to Q5, you know, type of uh, thing that two chess masters know, right? That is, a, a, that is the most minimal interface that you can create. <coughs> For the rest of us who want to play Chess Master, we want a nice interface that, that shows you chess and you understand where the pieces are on the board. You can see it. You can maybe even analyze your position, highlight some threats for you, things like that. But ultimately what you want is just an interface that lets you move a piece so that you can concentrate on the decision you make. Other kinds of games are athletic, both in the real world and in the computer world. So athletic games in the real world are sports. And in the computer world are games that demand more uh, um, in, the, in, uh, in the area of reflexes in order to play. Okay, so if you think about a sport like, say, basketball, um, there's no equivalent in basketball of two grandmasters playing chess in their heads. You don't ever see two basketball players playing basketball in their heads because basketball is not a very interesting abstract sport. There's nothing very interesting about putting a ball through a hoop. Uh, per se. It's not a very complicated thing to do. What makes basketball fun is the fact that if five guys are trying to stop you from putting a ball through a hoop, it's challenging. Okay? And the kinds of strategies you have to employ to avoid people's offensive and defensive moves in the physical world are, are, are what's crucial, not the abstract <coughs> rules of the game. Okay? And the same thing is true for, sport, obviously, for sports games on a computer. Right? What you want in those cases is an interface which allows you to steer and control and to master your reflexes. And if you have a sport that's highly strategic, like baseball or football, uh, you also probably want an interface that allows you to play more like a coach. Because to a coach of basketball or a coach of football, it is a highly abstract and interesting game. 
but only insofar as they can see the feedback from the other players. So we provide you with interfaces that are challenging when you're playing the sport and also allow you to have the same kind of strategic navigation for overall strategies. And the interface for like a game like Madden is largely what makes the game fun. If it's fun, it's fun because it's fun to navigate and difficult and challenging and requires reflexes. If it's boring, it's boring because the camera's all over the place and the guy's falling over and you know how to steer them. So in athletic games as well as in uh, uh, cerebral games, the elements that you're looking for overall, to what I've found in, in, in uh, human machine interfaces in general, is that you're looking for an absolute economy of degrees of freedom. You want to be a Scrooge about degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom for an interface means analogously what it means in physics. In physics, degree of freedom means how things can move in the world. And we live in a six degree of freedom world, right? We can rotate in three dimensions and we can translate in three dimensions. Um, we have all kind of evolved to survive six degrees of freedom pretty nicely. If you throw seven, eight, or nine at us physically, we'll start to, our brains will explode. On computers, we don't have quite the same level of fine control. So we find that in a, if you're navigating a 3D world, giving you five degrees of freedom uh, is pretty much the most we can do. And that kind of requires a keyboard and mouse to play. You'll notice in games like Quake and Doom, you can do pretty much everything except for tilt your head that way, right? The engine can, when you die, you fall over. But we don't give you a control for doing this because there's no point to it. And, and it gives you too many degrees of freedom. But we do like to let you look around and turn and move, right? Other games, um, like a top-down scroller or like Super Paper Mario. Uh, Super Paper Mario, when you're in 2D, uh, gives you pretty much two degrees of freedom. You can go up and down, you can go left and right. And when you go to 3D space, it gives you three degrees of freedom. Up, down, left, right, in, out, right? And that's kind of it. Right? The reason why we screwed you about degrees of freedom is to re you have to realize that people um, you know, only have so many ways that they want to steer. When you steer a car, it's very nice to know in the car that you basically have two degrees of freedom. You can, you can turn the wheel or you can move the pedals. If you had a complete six degree of freedom interface for steering a car, we'd probably see a lot more disasters, right? So you want to only give people degrees of freedom in their interface if it applies to a game feature that is interesting, fun, challenging to use. You don't want to bombard them with every possibility, every analog joystick you can possibly get. Now this is a shot from Dance Dance Revolution. This is an example of the ultimate sort of in the athletic interface. Dance Dance Revolution, if you haven't seen it, basically is a scrolling set of directional arrows that come up in groups. And there are these four arrows on a pad. And you have to move your feet to the pad uh, to match the arrows that you see. And it's just about the least interesting game in the world from an abstract point of view. Here are four arrows. Which four arrows are they? Push the buttons corresponding to them. If I can pause, and, you know, if this is a turn-based game, it's just about the least interesting thing in the world, right? Uh, what makes Dance Dance Revolution fun is that they're moving at you quickly, you can't slow them down, and you have to move your feet to match the patterns that you see. Okay. Uh, the thing that keeps Dance Dance Revolution from being impossible is that there's pretty much only four degrees of freedom, you know? Each button can either be pressed or not, and that's it. There's only four buttons. So that's the thing to keep in mind is how athletic are you expecting people to be and how can you minimize the number of <coughs> choices that they have in their head for what they're going to do. And that's basically what you want to do with interface. Okay, so given these components, interface, nouns, and verbs, what you end up with is a sort of a hodgepodge. And I'm, I'm going to use chess as my example from here on out uh, for, for, for describing rules here. Um, in chess, the nouns are pretty straightforward, right? Pawns, kings, rooks, the board itself is a noun. Um, the verbs are pretty straightforward. A piece may move from one square to another. Pieces may be captured. Those are the only verbs in chess. Okay? And if all I give you are the nouns and the verbs of chess, you have no game whatsoever. Because what you would be allowed to do in a, in a rule-free environment is remove any board from the piece at any time, move any board from, any, from one location to another at any time. Uh, a, board, a piece can, there are still, even in the absence of rules, the mere fact of nouns and verbs does limit us a little bit. Pieces cannot, in a, an abstract game of chess, exist between slots on the board. Each slot on the board is a noun. That may, a piece may occupy a slot. It may not occupy multiple slots. It's fundamental to the existence of these nouns and verbs that we've laid out. But a completely noisy game of chess is not any fun. So we develop a set of rules. And what rules are is like in quantum physics, they're like exclusion principles. 
you know, think of the Pauli exclusion principle as the reason that we're all alive today. Without it, our electrons would just fly across the galaxy, right? Rules are exclusion principles for game states. All right? And what you do is you want to map your total universe of possible game states and then use that, that your set of rules as a pairing knife to cut out certain illegal states. Okay? And this becomes a terrain model, which I'll examine a little bit deeper when I talk about the sims with respect to this. Okay, so for example, in chess, uh, I assume we're all kind of familiar with how to play chess. There is a, there are, a, a, the first rule you want to describe in chess is how the pieces can move. Pawn can't just go flying across the screen, you know, all this kind of stuff. Every piece has a set of legal moves it can make. Very good. The second rule you want to make is how capturing actually happens. Capturing must happen when a piece of one side moves into a square of the piece of another side. You don't just capture any piece that you want. Those are the only two rules to chess. A collection of how the pieces move and the rules for capturing. Then we have a terminal rule which says when the king is captured, you have lost. Now from these rules, we create a landscape. All right? You take every possible legal configuration of a chessboard. You can lay that out. That's, that could be enumerated. It would Actually doing it obviously would fill the galaxy, but conceptually. And you say for one given config legal configuration of a chessboard and another one, there are a couple possibilities. Either you can't get there straight from here, you know, like the queen existing here and then existing over here. She can't do that in one move, right? Um, or you can. Either white can get to this from, from, from board configuration A to board configuration B, or black can. So you take all of the possible board configurations and you connect them with white and black lines. A white line, mean, or arrow actually. A white arrow means you can get there from, white can get there from A to B. A black arrow means that black can get from A to B. Okay? And then furthermore, you color each node in the tree as either being black or white or gray. Black means black checkmate, black wins. White means white checkmate, white wins. Gray means uh, game not over. And the challenge of the game, then, if you, if you picture chess laid out that way, is, to, is for two players to try and navigate each other into cul-de-sacs of black or white where the other player cannot escape without being forced into a checkmate position. That's the physical metaphor for the game of chess. And it's pretty st simple and straightforward. When designing chess, you wouldn't actually have to use that visualization very much. Okay? But it's not so simple for more advanced games. And by advanced, I mean with a whole lot more variables in it. And a more advanced game than chess is The Sims. <coughs> okay? So The Sims is a game about social and economic success and failure. That's what you're supposed to do in The Sims. You're supposed to navigate your people through the world and have them become, uh, uh, make friends and develop a family and have a rich emotional life and get jobs and earn money and buy possessions and have a rich material life, okay? And the two things can be pursued fairly independently. Time is the dividing factor. And the more time you dedicate to one goal is time you're not dedicating to the other and your goals decay, okay? And so the trade-off between do I deal with my personal emotional wants and needs, do I get a job, do I try to fall in love in the game is decisions made up to the player. And you can fall between failure states where you're kind of messy and your girlfriend doesn't like you and you're in your underwear trying to play Nintendo, and success states where you know you're in some sort of cocaine paradise um, in, in, in Starface or whatever that's supposed to be. Um, and, and that's, you know, a lot harder to see than chess exactly what are all the possible legal states because they're much more finely grained than black and white positions on a board. And so what we do is we actually graph this landscape I was talking about <coughs> where we say, okay, the sort of blue is, and low is bad, yellow is better, green, tall is good, okay, and there are two axes, development of your family life and development of your career, right? And if you just develop your family life only, you can get to a certain point, but then if you dedicate so much to it that you're not making any money, your whole family hates you, so that gets down to the bottom. If you just develop your career, you actually don't ever bottom out because you can kind of be alone and be okay, but you don't ever max out because you're not really happy. And up here, where you've dedicated a good deal of effort to both your family and career, is sort of the top of the game. And the goal of the player is to kind of navigate this space and make little choices, compromising one to the benefit of the other while ratcheting your way up. And we actually visualize our state spaces this way. Very abstractly, we try not to be too literal about it, but we'll say things like, okay, your job is taking eight hours a day and you come home in a bad mood all the time that's gonna deteriorate your relationship. What can you do? Well, maybe you can use the money from your job to buy things that'll help you with your relationship. Or maybe you can get an easier job. And these are the kinds of decisions we want you to be confronted with making, okay? 
And we always want to be able to analyze where you are in the game with respect to these kinds of success and failure criteria. And one of the things I was mentioned on the other slide is that you want to be able to analyze these terrain in such a way that you can find that you have smooth, relatively smooth terrain, so people don't feel like they, if they take a step to the left, they fall in a hole. With good local maxima, good little traps that you can get into where you feel like any step you take is going to make you momentarily unimproved in, in, in your life, but you can see that there's a higher hill over there, and maybe there's a little dark valley between you and it. So you have to take a risk in order to get a reward, and that's visible to you. That's a good game state terrain. A bad game state terrain is basically a minefield. It's flat or noisy with lots of little local minima, holes that you can fall into without any obvious way when you're in a hole as to which way to go to get out of the hole. Okay? And you can actually speak in these metaphors uh, and use that metaphor to criticize the way that you're developing, uh, the way that your game is developing, which is not necessarily a way to invalidate the nouns and verbs and interface. Quite often this is just a matter of tuning. Right? So when you have your rule set that's completely open, like in The Sims, if you go into The Sims and you cheat up all the money and you turn off motives, there's no game. You know, you don't, your, your motives don't decay, you never get tired or hungry or your hygiene doesn't decay. Um, and there, you've maxed out your money, you can buy any object in the game, and the game is totally open. And people love that. It's a creativity device. It allows them to develop rules for themselves or to, to express themselves without rules. And what we find in Maxis games is it's often important to provide that, to remove the framework of rules, to allow people to just completely explore the space of what we're creating. But most people buy a game because they want some challenge, and so we do provide rules uh, by default. Um, other games that, that you know, we're working on others can provide different sets of rules depending on how you want to play. They have different terrain and different sets of challenges. So, this is all well and good, and it's fairly abstract, okay? Uh, if, you know, you can take what I just said there, and if I had more time, I would be providing more concrete examples, and we could workshop it. You can design a game called Blue Squares versus Red, you know, Squares, and have Blue Squares and Red Squares fighting it out on some board, and the idea is to preserve the Blue Squares or to preserve the Red Squares and to be completely abstract and, uh, in principle, fun, but people wouldn't relate to it necessarily. Maybe someday we will. You know, maybe we'll become so good at thinking in completely abstract terms that puzzle games will be utterly satisfying all the time. Puzzle games are those kinds of games. Games that just say, all that matters is understanding the rules. I'll throw some fiction in there about chickens and eggs or jewels or Tetris bricks falling or whatever, but you're not really committed to that idea. You're committed to learning how these things interact with each other and, and puzzling them. Okay, but most games are not puzzle games. Most games do want to provide you with a sense of fiction that this game, like in The Sims, relates to the real world. It's not just six abstract numbers that you're trying to balance out. Okay? And that's where fiction uh, comes in. Now, the fiction provides the context of the story, the premise, the character setting. And the real issue with fiction is that um, most game developers, actually, once we get into designing, we consider the fiction kind of a secondary element to the game, to a piece of entertainment. It's a very, nobody ever thinks that way. Um, about you know, storytelling or writing a novel or a movie, you always think that the fiction is what you're beginning with. You know, are you doing Star Wars or are you doing American Beauty? It really matters because you you're trying to tell a real story. If you're writing a novel, you have to decide you know, what are you trying to say about the human condition or about bears or aliens or whatever it is that you're writing about. You know? Fiction centers us when we're working in every other art form. In games, fiction is... By and large, when you're in the midst of designing the game, pretty much just the marketing excuse for putting out your red square versus blue square game. It's not red squares and blue squares, it's zombies versus space marines, you know, or it's elves versus space marines, <laughs> right? And that's why we often pick these very sort of perfunctory, throwaway, quick fictional frameworks. That's why everybody uh, is doing a Lord of the Rings game and a Star Wars game, is because we really kind of don't care. We'll just take the most basic fantasy fiction that we can and give it to you. And that's kind of how we've addressed fiction over the years. The problem with that is that the reason that we could do that was because fiction didn't matter too much to the consumer either. They were interested in the technology and in the challenge of the game. It was a small niche market pretty much of geeks who like to play games who played computer games. Nowadays, computer games are mainstream entertainment. And mainstream people, and I hear I call them politicians, consider fiction to be primary. All right? And that's why we have these, these dialogues you know, in, in, at the national level about like, 
uh, Grand Theft Auto, oh my god, it's so horrible. You're in the, you run up to a hooker and you hit her with a crowbar and then you're in this car and this is ridiculous. Well, the people who are playing those games by and large, the ones who aren't sociopaths, don't think in those terms. They think of that as humor. That's a joke. I mean, that's just, it's just you're, you're doing some silliness. What this is is I've, I've walked up to a resource. I've engaged in an athletic challenge in order to exploit that resource. I've improved my stats and I'm moving on to the next challenge area. Right? That's the actual thinking that's going on in the head. And it may very well be um, I'm, that associating those kinds of abstract and morally neutral goals with morally repugnant imagery will create an association in the mind of people who walk out into the real world. Or it could be that people understand the difference between fan uh, fantasy and fiction and reality and that these moral conundra are put in for a reason, which they are, which is to get you to not want to do the right thing. By right, I mean smart. So you pick up a game uh, that's challenging. So you have to do this, this, and this to do that. And if I give it to you in completely abstract terms, it's very easy to get you to do the right thing. You'll just, oh, I'll, I'll go to the red square and turn the red square into a pink square and drag the pink square over to the purple square and extract the blue, and then I've won, right? But if I tell you no, for example, in Bioshock, I don't know if you played Bioshock. So Bioshock is a game where you're basically in this under underwater industrial um, dystopia and the, a horrible genetic thing has happened and zombies are running around but they're still basically human and some of them are little girls. Okay. And you have to make a choice whether when you encounter these little girls whether to harvest them for their power which you can use to become stronger and complete the game and you're trying to save the world so you know and they're zombies or you can save them in which case you get a little bit less of an advantage but the girls are saved. And they become, they stay alive. And the way the game is constructed is absolutely economically the wrong thing to do to save the girls. It also has no real impact on how the game finishes, except for that you get deemed evil or good by the final animation, which has no bearing whatsoever on whether you completed the game. So it puts you in this moral conundrum of like, am I going to choose to do the thing that's beneficial to my character and watch this like tearing a girl's head off moment again and again? Or am I going to do the thing that is emotionally as a decent human being? I'm, I'm confronted with doing. Right? And let this girl go. So that's the importance of fiction in these games. And we've historically underappreciated it. The ethical dilemmas are important. We introduce those ethical dilemmas to make the game more challenging by exploiting the existence of morality in humans. Not by trying to degrade it, but by exploiting it. The problem is when you exploit people's, um, for lack of a better word, weaknesses, they tend to want to abandon them. And that's what people are afraid of. Talk about violent games. So when you're developing the fiction of your game, which is now a very dominant thing to do, unless you're going to be developing games for cell phones, which are all puzzle games, you're going to have to think of how your fiction relates. The important concept for how fiction relates, and I think I have just enough time to get through this, um, is diegesis. Okay. The word for what I was just describing to you is diegesis. Diegesis is a word that comes from um, um, the cinema world and from the drama world. And it basically means, with regard to cinema, um, those elements which, uh, diegesis is the analysis of elements in your film uh, on the basis of whether they exist in the fictional world or do not, okay? So diegetic elements are things that are said to exist within the fiction. Within the fiction that you're looking at, they're supposed to be there. Non-diegetic elements are things that are only for the audience, that the characters in the film are not supposed to know about. And this applies to computer games as well. Transdiegetic elements are elements that span that gap, where there are elements that are known only to you, the player, or the audience, and elements that are understood by the players. Okay, so here's, uh, just for an example, here's the Sims again. Um, in the Sims, here, the pinball machines, the people, you know, uh, the bathrooms, the street, all that, all of that is diegetic. There's a fictional world in which these characters reside. Okay, and they're supposed to know each other and that these things are here. There are non-diegetic elements, like this over here, this control panel, which allows you to go to the upper and lower floor to manipulate the camera, to go to load save, to take a picture, to go into build mode so you can buy objects, go back to live mode so you can watch them play out. The, player, the characters in the game are not supposed to know about any of this. None of this, they don't respond to the fact that, of, of the existence of any of this. Okay, so that's non-diegetic. Transdiegetic is over here. This is the relationship panel to the characters who are in the room with you. When you are this character here, a little diamond over her head. 
These are the people in the room. This is what you think of them. All right. Do you like them, dislike them, love them, hate them? Is it your brother or sister? Is it your mom and dad? Is it a stranger? Is it your roommate? Okay. Those relationships are abstract nouns that exist within the Sims. Okay. They connect two players together. The, pl the characters within the Sims are aware of the relationships and they make decisions based on them. This presentation of the relationships okay, is non diet So the relationships are diegetic. The pre this presentation is non-diegetic. No one is walking around with a risk panel that's, <laughs> that's got a picture of everybody with a bar that says how much they like them. Now this would be as opposed to a completely uh, diegetic relationship model, which would be, say, a family album on a desk. And if your character <laughs> would go up to a family album on a desk and open it up and see her family tree and see her list of all of her friends, then that record exists in the world. And that's the only presentation I give you, then relationships in The Sims would be diegetic. But because there is a GUI panel that bring, comes up that, that the, player, the players can't see, we call it transdiegetic. So why is diegesis an important way to understand the relationship between your fiction and your game feature? I'm going to use the example of a, the diegetic evolution of load save is uh, it, what's important. Slide for that. Okay. So, um, long story short, you have to be able to save your games in a computer game, right? A computer game, uh, arcade games are a lot like jukeboxes. It's like listening to music. You play a game, it lasts about five minutes. You dance to a song, it lasts about five minutes. It's over. You don't need to save. Playing a computer game on a home computer or a console is more akin to reading a book. It's something that's a lot of chapters. It's supposed to take 40 hours. You're supposed to be able to stop it and pause it and get back and do something else and come back to it. And so we have to build a save. Right? And early on in the development of computer games, load save was just, just entirely a non-diegetic player convenience so that you can say, stop, sh shut down, I'm going to sleep, I'll come back, I'll play you later. And we never really considered it part of gameplay. It was just like, like in SimCity, you just save your city like, it's a, you're, like you're working with a document in Word. You go to file save. And, go file load and play some other save, right? And we don't really think of load save as, as part of the challenge of the game. And this is true of many games for a long time, until we started to see games like uh, Wing Commander, or uh, the sort of flight simulator, sort of carrier-based flight simulator mission games. And these games, what they ran into was a little bit of a technical problem and a little bit of an exploit problem. An exploit is where some feature of the software is usable by the player in a way that subverts the challenge of the game. Which is this, if you let me save in the middle of a, of a dog fight, there's all kinds of circumstances where I can use that to buy myself some time to reload, to try a couple of different things. And what they found with a lot of these games is that if you want to save in the middle of a dog fight, well, there's a ton of data out there. Things might be exploding. There's particles all over the place. You can't throw any of it out for fear of introducing a, uh, an exploit. But when you land your aircraft and you go over to the docking bay, most of that data disappears. And you're just in this little adventure game you know, environment where all that matters is which missions have you completed and how many points do you have. That's a lot easier to save. I mean, it's just like three pieces of information. So a lot of these games by default start saying, well, you just can't save while you're flying around. You have to fly, do your battle, come back and save. And it's completely just an expediency to do that. But what they started to notice was, hey, you can't save while you're flying around. That means the longer and more challenging I make missions, the tougher the game is. And I can give you options of saying extending a mission to get more points, but risking dying and having to start all over, or ending a mission early. So mission design started to follow the fact that you couldn't save during missions. Furthermore, unlike, say, SimCity, where it was original SimCity, where you just say file save, and there's no fictional basis for load save whatsoever, we started to say, well, why can you only save on your carrier? You know, how are we going to introduce that to the player that they can only save? Well, let's give them a kiosk they have to walk up to to update their flight profile. Or their, or their personnel profile. That's the fiction. So now, saving your game is given a diegetic element. It's no longer just a file menu, it's a kiosk. Okay, that's kind of cute. So what? So, as we proceeded to consoles, we started to find that there aren't just flight simulator games and games that for technical reasons or for just, just quick design reasons we don't want to give you load save. Um, we started to see that there were certain kinds of games where load save uh, arbitrary load save just became a real problem. And one good example of that is Doom. Uh, you play Doom. In Doom, you can save and load your game at any time. Anywhere, anytime, you can save and load your game. So the design of Doom became limited by the fact that what you, the best strategy for playing was to walk up to a door, save, open the door, get barbecued by whatever's standing there, but you've seen it as a human being, what's behind the door, you can anticipate it for the next time, load your game, stand to the edge of the door, 
get the right weapon, do this, blow the thing away, and walk in. That's the strategy for playing Doom. It actively involves loading and saving as part of playing the game, not as part of maintaining your lifestyle and not being stuck to a computer game forever. Once load save became part of the strategy for Doom, the guys at id didn't respond the way I would have. They said, well, since walking up to a door, saving your game, opening it, dying, reloading, opening it, and blasting away is the strategy, let's just start surprising the player with monsters constantly. So the last couple of dooms that I played, you walk down a hallway and something jumps out at you. You didn't have a chance to save. Aha, I got you. And level design became completely annoying because you're just subverting the fact that you know that if I'm going to walk into a dark area, I'm going to save the game first. Right? And so you start, you get into this battle of wills with the game designer where you're trying to anticipate whether something's going to be dangerous and they just try to be more and more arbitrary about surprising you. And it begins to decay. The way that other games have solved it, and this is a joke from Prince of Persia, um, is that they created save points, like the flight simulator kiosk. You just put kiosks throughout the various levels of the game, and you cannot save until you go up to the kiosk and do some highly diegetic thing. And in Prince of Persia, the kiosks are fountains. When you go up to a fountain and you drink, your game saves. Okay? It's entirely diegetic. The, 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 the Prince of Persia knows that if he goes up to a fountain and drinks, and he dies later on, he will wake up at that fountain. That's just part of the fiction of the game. Okay. And the, the advancement of save points in a game meant that now, when you can load and save a game, can be put into level design. Not just for designing missions for a flight simulator, but when you're running through a maze. You can say, you're not going to be able to save until you, get, you have to island hop between save points. You won't be able to save until you run through this horrible corridor. I gotcha. Now, if you think about it, Doom could do the same thing, right? It could just, Doom has a totally non-diegetic save environment where you just hit a button and say, you saved my game. It doesn't matter. The player doesn't know you, the character doesn't know you did it. But to get the same mechanic, they could have, they could have arbitrarily said, we're going to gray out the save button when you're in areas where we don't want you to save. We'll just have that be part of the level design. We'll just, in the level tool, you just put a green circle around any part of the level where the save button is active and a black one around anywhere where it's not, and that's it, okay? Um, and as the player walks through, they'll notice this thing go gray, not gray, gray, not gray. And if you think about it, that's exactly abstractly the same thing as putting save points in the game. It's the same mechanic. I'm limiting your ability to save the game. But that kind of thing doesn't test very well. Disabling people's UI, non-diegetic UI, arbitrarily, because of something they're doing in the diegetic world, creates a psychological split. You say, well, why is this? I have no idea what the rules are here. Why did you gray this out? I, I, why are you taking tools out of my palette and not telling me why? But if you put an icon in or a kiosk or an object in the world that uh, associates you with your power to save the game, even though nothing has changed except for the fictional communication, the feature gets accepted. Okay. So this all kind of happened in this stumbling way. Um, where we, you know, load save is, 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 is a great point of contention because it's a game feature, it's a universal game feature that's existed since the early 80s to now in pretty much the same form. You know, it's always the same problem. We solved it initially. There's not been a huge advancement in the technology of load save. Load save is, you know, it's very basic. But its relationship to the fiction of the game has evolved over the years as fiction has become this deeper and deeper part of the game. As we move in life to where computer games are more and more, more and more tied to the fiction and where we're more and more required to justify fictions that can be problematic for people like in, in Grand Theft Auto, it's incumbent upon us to understand the diegetic relationship to fiction and to understand what's in the player's mind about what's going on in that world and what the player imagines the diet that is the significance of the diegetic elements of the world. And also to recognize from something like, like the load save experience that we can very well say that in a game like Grand Theft Auto, or I don't want to think of Grand Theft Auto, there's lots of very violent games. And I love them, by the way. I've not, I'm not love violent computer games, but they're a lot of fun. But I also have a strongly developed sense of what's fantasy and what's reality. Um, that little things like this, little notions of I'm saving my game in the world versus I'm saving my game on my desktop um, matter to people. Those metaphors really mean something. And their enjoyment 
of your product is very much based upon forming that relationship. Uh, as much as it is about all of the abstract stuff I started off with, rules, nouns, interfaces, and things like that. So that's basically it. Um, My thanks. This is my name again and my email. Uh, feel free to contact me. I do respond to my email. I'll give you a few seconds on that, or I'll give it to you later. And I do have some further reading here. Uh, basically, the way to think about games and game development, uh, you know, as we move forward, is this young, growing art form where we can learn a lot from the art forms that have come before. Understanding Comics and Reinventing Comics by Scott McCloud are two great books about the comic art form, which is very similar to ours in that it's a small niche art form that has evolved relatively recently, but has a lot of understandable forms in the same way that we do. And then specifically more for games, a theory for fu of fun for game design will give you many more concrete examples of the kinds of things I was talking about, especially in the first three elements, uh, uh, the, the interface, the nouns, the verbs, the rules, how these things interact, how you can characterize them, what degrees of freedom you're giving the player, what thing, you know? What what combinations of verbs are are interact well with each other? How to pair trees? Theory of Fun gives many more concrete examples of that. And Ernest Adams on game design and Andrew Rawlings on game design. Uh, again, same same kind of thing. They they will go into more detail as to how to craft these things. So if you can think about it, what I've given you is an idea of like, what is sculpture? Sculpture is bricks and chisels and hammers. <laughs> right, so I've sort of described bricks and chisels and hammers, but how you make a sculpture um, is more available in these sources. So thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> Do you have time for any uh, questions? Questions, anyone? Spore? <laughs> We're taping? <laughs> going to be on tape. I was for uh, it's coming along pretty well. Um, you know, it's it's uh, as I said, it's it's been challenging because there are so many different moving parts that we're, you know, we're learning a lot about taking taking the, the high level look at it. But uh, my understanding is that we're are, we're targeting for for uh, early mid next year, and that that should be okay. Anything else? Questions? Going once. Second life. Uh, well, when you don't want to have a non-diegetic world anymore, <laughs> second life is good for that. I have a lot of friends at second life. I have close friends who went there. You know, I didn't meet them through second life. Uh, worked there. Um, I love things like second life. I worked on The Sims Online, which was uh, supposed to be a competition for second life. Didn't do as well as we would have liked. Um, the notion of getting people used to the idea of treating life and socialization and uh, property ownership and relationships abstractly is something that I like. What um, the criticism that often comes not just to Second Life but of social networks in general, internet in general, is that it's so distancing, it's so distancing. And I have never really accepted that that criticism at all. I think what's distancing is being bound to your local community in such a way that you don't even know what's happening over the next hill. Right, and not having the opportunity to communicate with people of different religions and different cultures and in different languages and coming from different places in this life. And so while I would never want to see virtual communities like that replace local involvement and having friends who you know are your friends and who are doing not just a checkbox on a screen, uh, I do think that it's a, at this point, an invaluable enhancement to the way that we live. Uh, is for us as individual human Democrats, small d Democrats, to interact with each other this way. Because the option for not having things like Second Life or the Sims Online or things like that uh, is for each of us to be prisoners of the technology that's been handed down to us by others. And um, that would pretty much put us in the position that people in the 50s and 60s were with respect to television. We become passive recipients of the official story instead of active participants in creating the real world. Uh, and in that respect, I find things like Second Life to be nothing but encouraging. Thank you very much. <laughs>